Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. We have now resumed in-person worship with one service at 10 a.m., which is live streamed both on Facebook and on YouTube. We alternate each week between contemporary and traditional music. You may confirm worship times and receive more information by visiting our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our first scripture reading comes from the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human scorned by others and despised by many. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it is with, was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a postured, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down before him, shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that, it, that he has done it. Our second scripture reading comes from the ninth chapter of Isaiah and offers a promise of the one to come. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. 
In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you. As with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Our final reading comes from the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child then, also an heir through God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to, to God. God. When I lived in Santa Fe in my pre-ministry years, one of the houses I lived in was on the south side of town. It's actually on the south side of the interstate. And the entire south side of the house was covered with windows, which gave me fantastic views uh, of the valley. It was hard to heat in the winter, and the birds hated it because they kept running into the windows. One time, a bird hit the window so hard, I thought for sure that she had broken her neck, but when I went out later to, to collect her, she wasn't there. Turns out she wasn't dead. She was just stunned. But if you've ever seen a bird recovering from being knocked out by running into a window, there's a, a certain ritual that all birds go through. The first is that they sort of fluff their feathers out and they just sort of sit as a little puffball of feathers for a while, a little drooped over. And then they'll start to walk around and they'll shake a leg out and then shake the other one out and then shake a wing out and shake the other one out. And they keep doing that for a while and scientists believe it sort of reconnects their minds and bodies and returns them back to some sense of normal, reminds them that they are a bird and how it is that they, they fly. But they don't just get right up and fly as soon as they fall to the ground. It takes them a while. And so birding groups recommend that if you find a bird that's flown into a window and it's unconscious, to, um, and it's not a safe place to take the bird and put it into a, a container and put it into a dark, warm space and let them go through that ritual. Give them several hours in order to, to fluff their feathers and do the little shaking and, and reconnect their brains and minds together. Sometimes life is like that. To push the analogy just a little bit further... Sometimes we can see the things that are going to hit us and we can brace ourselves. But most often the things that bring us to our knees, the things that bring us to a service like that, like tonight, are those windows that we don't see that we slam into unexpectedly, that drop us to the ground. The windows that we slam into that perhaps even sometimes we might wish and say, why didn't it just kill me rather than leaving me here to suffer in pain and the turmoil of the afterwards? And so when I counsel people who are in the midst of grief on what to do, my best advice is simply be present. Feel what you need to feel in this moment and simply be. 
After losing his mother, the author Sherman Alexi said he was talking to his sister and he asked how she was doing and she said, it hurts to breathe, but I'm doing all right. And he said he thought that was the best definition of grief that he'd ever heard. It hurts to breathe, but I'm doing all right. In those moments, explanations of our grief, defenses of God, of why this has happened, it's all part of some grand design or whatever it is we might say are not really helpful, and that's not my purpose tonight. Instead, is to give us space to give voice. To voice what it is that we are affected by that brings us here tonight. And I know for some, just showing up is a major step. But it's also to hear that it's okay to feel whatever it is that we're, we're feeling and that God is with us and that God cares what happens to us. And it's also just to be present here for each other, to, to carry one another's burdens, as Paul says. Because some come to this service because they're experiencing what St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. And others are here because they've been in that place and they want to support those who need that tonight. And I've been in both of those places. Last year at Blue Christmas, I mentioned that normally we put up thousands of lights on our house, or I do. But one year we didn't put up a single light because I simply couldn't do it. The church where we were serving at the time had lost two church members. We had them die very suddenly and unexpectedly. And then our youngest daughter was born and spent the first week of her life in the, in the NICU and then was closely monitored for the next month and a half. And when it got to Christmas, I just didn't have the energy to do any of it. If we didn't have older children, we probably would have skipped it all together. But we did put up a tree and we exchanged presents to have some Christmas that year. But when I told somebody else in the church what we were going through and we didn't have any lights up, he said that for the first time in 10 years, he'd actually put up lights that year. For the first time since the death of his daughter 10 years before. And so I sort of imagined that 10 years for him was him fluffing his feathers, trying to reconnect his mind and his, his body and his soul all to, to, together to be able to remember what it means to fly. Or maybe you continue decorating simply because you don't want to answer the questions that when people say, well, why didn't you decorate this year? Because the answers are simply too painful. So again, my purpose is not to justify or explain away what's going on in our lives, but simply to give us this place to name it and to give a message of hope to allow us maybe to fluff our feathers a little bit in this place and to be present in this moment. But here's the, the crux of Christmas. Has anyone here ever been in total darkness I don't mean like you're out in the, the forest and there's a new moon, so it's really dark. I mean, putting your hand in front of your face and not being able to see it darkness. Ben had that experience twice in a couple of caves we've gone into. But how much light does it take to break that darkness when it's just absolute? All it takes is a pinprick to make a difference in that moment. And without the light, the darkness can actually feel oppressive. You can actually feel the weight of it. I think that's a great title for a book, The Weight of Darkness. But just a small light pushes that darkness back, shatters it. And that's what Christmas is about. Because we don't have Christmas because things are great. We have Christmas because, as Isaiah said in that passage we heard, because we've walked in the land of darkness. If life were holly, jolly, and merry all the time, we wouldn't need Christmas. We have Christmas because we slam into windows every now and then. And people we love slam into windows. And we need to know that our falling is not in vain. 
So we heard in, that, in the, the 22nd Psalm, which begins with that cry of forsakenness, that we hear Jesus uh, quote from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it moves on, talking about the, the psalmist's pain and suffering and sorrow, that he's been poured out like water, his heart is like wax and it's melting. The bowls of Bashan are circling him. But then there's this subtle shift that begins to happen, and a shift to praise. And the psalmist says, but God did not hide God's face from me. God heard my cries of despair. The future, future generations will hear of this deliverance. Future generations will know of God's purpose and God's hope in this moment. So as I, I read the 22nd Psalm, I don't imagine that was written all at one sitting, right? He didn't just start out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a, that's a psalm written over time, and it's written in hindsight. Because often it's in, only in hindsight that we see God's actions in our lives. We start out with that cry of forsakenness. And we wonder, where are you, God, in this midst? You, I don't feel you. I cry and you don't, you don't answer. But later, we see God's presence has been with us there all along. Because we need to know that our falling is not in vain. And then we need to know that we will learn to fluff our feathers again and learn how to fly but that it might take time. That there are moments when it hurts to breathe, but that hope is there and light is there and new life is there, even if we can't imagine it or see it in the moments of our cry of despair. Perhaps we can't even imagine that it won't hurt every day like it hurts today. But Christmas is that moment for us, the light entering into the world. To tell us that we are not alone, that the darkness will not overcome us, that God is here to walk this journey with us because the, the word becomes flesh and dwells amongst us. And that the spirit will give us the power to move when our whole body aches and we might even not think how we even get out of bed. We need to know of God's hope in that moment to know that there is something more. And so we gather and we hear this story of Mary giving birth and lying her baby in a manger, knowing the end of the story that she will lose her son. And knowing that God too knows the pain of losing a child, but that God offers us this, this light, that God offers us this new day in the power of resurrection. Because I think that's what maybe the, the bird who hit my window experience was a little bit of a resurrection. I don't know how long it took her to get everything working again, how long she was there before she could fly off, how long her headache lasted. But she was able to fly again. Although I can imagine when she first hit that window, she never thought that was a possibility because I certainly didn't. But she took the time to do what she needed, and she simply was present for a while. And after I read what birds do when they hit windows, not only I think that was a great metaphor for traumatic events in our lives, I, I thought of that passage from Galatians that we heard about the fullness of time. That's one of my favorite lines from Paul's letters, in the fullness of time. Because I'm not sure exactly what it says, what it means, but it just seems magic. Jesus, not born too soon, not born too late, he came at the right time. And Jesus came not because everything was good, but because things were broken. And we needed this message of hope. We needed his light to overcome the darkness. And we needed to know that we had been redeemed, that we needed to know that we were adopted by God as beloved sons and daughters, becoming heirs to the promise because of the Son. 
And since we've been adopted, we know that God, like a parent, loves us even more than what we can imagine parents' love looks like. And that God does not abandon us in times of need. That God comes in the fullness of time to be with us in our triumphs and tragedies, even in the valley of the shadow of death. To provide the light that shines for us in the darkness. To provide us with the hope we need in order to remember and find a new normal. A new way of moving forward in that fullness. A new way of moving forward in the power of the spirits. A new way of moving forward with God. Because our losses don't go away. They, they get easier with time. Especially when we turn them over to God, who doesn't cause these things to happen, but God can redeem all situations because God too knows loss. Because God gave us his son, the light of the world. And although the world tried to defeat that light, to overcome that light, it failed because light overcomes darkness. And so on this longest night of the year, we remember that starting today, the days get a little longer, the light gets a little bit more. It may be imperceptible, but it's happening. We know that it's the same way with what God is doing in our lives. So on this night, in this season, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to take time to recuperate and recover. You don't just get right back up after trauma. Sometimes we have to take the time to fluff our feathers and sit and rest so that God can once again lift us up to give us, as I say, Isaiah says, mount us up with wings like eagles so that we can fly into God's light. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel and Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you haven't already.